Hey, everybody, this is Joshua Lewis with The Remnant Radio. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We've got a really exciting episode with Pastor Greg Stone. He's the Messianic Pastor of Gateway. It's going to be a great episode. I apologize that I look and feel much hotter than normal. Had some router problems. I apologize that we're a few minutes late, but this is going to be a great episode. You guys stay tuned. You're right. I've got Pastor Greg. Uh, you are the Messianic Pastor from Gateway. Tell us yeah. a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your ministry, and how people can follow you. Um, I am. I'm Jewish. I'm married. Got five grown kids. Got twelve grandkids. I am the. Uh, uh, I recently did the DNA test because my my kids asked me to, and came back 100 percent Jewish. So there's nobody in. <laughs> so my, you're not faking it. I'm not faking it <laughs> at Praise all. Praise God. Right? Bar mitzvah when I was 13. All and, right. And. Uh, my rabbi was the vice president of the World Jewish Council. So well, that's I guess I'm pretty Jewish. Very Jewish. And uh, I do get to, I'm very blessed to serve at Gateway Church. Amen. Um, we have a, a fantastic pastor, Robert Morris. And uh, he has a heart for, uh, to the Jew first. The church has that heart. And I just really feel like I've just been, I'm the most blessed guy I know. We've had a few guys from Gateway come on the program, and I have been trying to get one of them to say something bad about Pastor Morris, and none of them will do it. Hmm. He's just a great guy or something. I don't know. When I first started at Gateway, I... You'd have a few things to say? Or... No. <laughs> no I, I would... Oh, don't get me get started. For the first six months, and I think to myself, it is so obvious why people love this man. Yeah. yeah. He's a good guy. That's so cool. that, that's really, that's yeah. my testimony. Well, this that is a cool show. This is like the first time we're really diving into this topic, I feel like. I mean, we've kind of danced around it a little bit, but we haven't authentic Jewish man, pastor in the house today. Um, diving right in, most importantly, the question I had was, um, when choosing a yarmulke, are you fashion conscious? I can be, absolutely. You can be. I, I can noticed be. that it matches your shirt it tonight. It can match so. my shirt, mm -hmm. or it can just be, uh, I have one of my favorites is a smiley face. And You have uh, a smiley I face? I have a smiley that face. That is so I awesome. I love that one. And then yeah. I have a Superman one. Okay. And that's, uh, I get more comments on that one than any other. Yeah. One. Yeah. yeah. Usually it's, it could be anything. That's cool. So yeah. that, that's pretty neat. I remember that reminds me of like, I go to the Navajo Nation once a year during the summer and they have their traditional garb they wear. But a lot of the, the younger people are like, are implementing things like Superman and Spider-Man and stuff into traditional Navajo garb. It's pretty cool to see those kind of cultures as the cultural things mix. So I have a Spider-Man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Spidey's my favorite. So. There it is. so, so, and as long as we are just totally a, a cultural appropriation on this episode, <laughs> he's um, not. Uh, no, no, uh, uh, well, I know you're he's not. Legit. But uh, if we're gonna go there, is it like, is it like hats or not hats, like ties? Like on Father's Day, your kids get you a tie. Is that like a thing that they get you yarmulkes? No, they've never. That that's. You know, I need to encourage them to do that. Yeah, <laughs> never, I mean, I never had. But they are they are a collectible item for me. Every time I go to Israel, I make sure I, I get a yarmulke go. or two. Yeah. yeah, my parents went to Israel. Uh, man, I want to say, was it well, with Buddy? Was it yeah, 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 it wasn't Buddy. too long ago. Yeah, so it was like two or three months ago. He was, yeah. he was one of our producers that we've had. Um, anyway, they they went to Israel together and they asked, you know, what do you want? And I was like, the most Jewish thing I could think of was a shofar. So they brought me back a, a shofar. And then my brother asked me how I knew it was a Jewish shofar instead of like made in China so far. And I told him, well, the ram was circumcised on the eighth day. <laughs> um, anyway, sorry. Uh, not, not, not true. Anyway, uh, right. so, so tell us a little bit about the Messianic Roots movement and how this is an important lens to read scripture through. Uh, I think a lot of us, we will approach the text. I think um, one of my favorite times that, that the Jewish understanding of certain events and the historical significance of those events uh, impacted me was when I was reading the story of uh, the pool of Bethesda and the angel who comes down and, and, and they started they, they read to me the Hallel and they read to me, um, you know, the rock of salvation that would bring forth healing from its waters and those kinds of things. They literally were praising God for this rock of salvation. Uh, but then Jesus stands up on the feast and is like, no, no, guys, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. And it really changes the entire dynamic of the text when you understand the Jewish roots of it. So give us maybe some understanding of, of the Jewish root, roots movement, why it's important for us as Christians to kind of keep our pulse on on that thinking. Well, I think if we if we 
divorce ourselves from from the Hebrew scriptures, and I prefer the word Hebrew scriptures rather than Old Testament, okay. because uh, the Old Testament is really Moses. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, it actually says that without the, that it takes the shedding of blood to have a covenant. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so Moses gave us the, that first covenant, as mm-hmm. it were. That's what Hebrews is talking about. Abraham is not the old covenant. Abraham is the promise. So mm-hmm. when you really want to dissect it right, as it were, if you want to talk Old Testament, you really want to be talking about Moses. And if you want to talk about Abraham, which we're all children of Abraham, mm-hmm. right? Then that's the promise. So, and so if we divorce ourselves from the Hebrew scriptures, mm-hmm. okay, then really what we're doing is we're just making things up. <laughs> that's good, right? And and, and you you could make up anything. Yeah. For um, uh, the old saying, you know, um, you you could prove anything from scripture. You know, the scripture says that uh, in one place it says it says go and do likewise. In another place it says Judas went out and hung himself. Yeah. Right. Put those two right. verses right. together, you come up with right. Yeah. It's just crazy. But but First Corinthians. 15 says that this is of first importance that Christ died for our sins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing else in the Bible where it says this is of first importance. And what is it uh, that is of first importance? He died for our sins and that he rose again. So then we would want to ask ourselves, what is the definition of sin? Right. Well, First John chapter three verse four actually defines sin for us. This is New Testament. Mm-hmm. It defines sin as lawlessness. Mm-hmm. Right. And Second uh, Thessalonians chapter two verse three actually calls the Antichrist the man of lawlessness. And so, if we divorce ourselves from the proper use of the Hebrew scriptures, we come up with just anything. Yeah. And and you just got all kinds of problems. So so to be clear, um, uh, I want to make sure that I'm hearing you correctly. Sorry, I'm switching while, while doing this show. Um, when you say old covenant, the covenant was ratified through Moses as the intermediary. Um, the the covenant was made through Abraham. Is that the way that we say that? Or the well, promise? I would just the say promise. Is Abraham is, is the Abraham. father, you know. Okay. And so um, and there is a an old covenant that Moses gave the the the, the Sinai covenant. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, he's the mediator of it. Actually, mm-hmm. God is the one who gave it. Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, and so uh, when when we when we use the word old covenant, I think it's best to uh, to understand we're really talking about Moses, mm-hmm. because obviously what the Lord did was it affected the way we relate with the law. As sure. It, okay, and so he he affected it, but. Um, uh, but what he affected was what Moses did. He did not remove a- what Abraham did. Abraham remains the patriarch for all of us. Abraham remains uh, the the father. Sure. Right? So so he's our patriarch. He's our father. He's the um, the founder of our. So so we're all in the place now uh, of following in the footsteps of Abraham. Abraham who believed a promise, and we believe the promises of God, and therefore we walk in faith. Mm-hmm. So we are really in the similar relationship now with God as the relationship that Abraham had. So would you would you affirm like the idea that there are, I don't want to say multiple covenants, like um, you know Adam is given, there's shedding of blood, covers Absolutely. Adam with that. Uh, you've got Moses who you know cuts up the birds and God walks through them in the fire. That's a super cool story. Love it. Yeah. Um, we've got a. Uh, uh, David, you know, David, you've got, I was thinking even Noah, I was getting ahead of myself when I said Abraham, Noah, he gets off the boat, makes the sacrifices, accepts it, God accepts it. Um, there's multiple, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to, uh, uh, rainbows in the sky. I'm not going to flood the earth again. You could call it a covenant. There's multiple layers of that covenant that culminates in Moses. Absolutely. And, and then and he says that there's not going to be another covenant made until the new Moses shows up. The one that I speak to face to face like that. Is that a, is that a fair? Yeah, absolutely. Almost a closing of the canon with Moses in yeah, a sense until I don't, I don't the like next to, prophet comes. Except I, I wouldn't want to say it closed be, sure. because um, I think that there is an abiding eternal uh, 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 foundation that Moses gave us. One of the things that it's really interesting to study is if you go to the to the book of Exodus and you look up what are the Ten Commandments called, mm-hmm. the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, 21 times in 20 different verses will be called the testimony. They're called the tablets of the testimony or the two tablets of the testimony or the testimony of God. The Ten Commandments are the testimony of God. Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay? I mean, that's easy to see. They're Jesus' testimony. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're how he lived and they're why he died. Mm-hmm. He never violated one of those commandments. Right. We violated all of them and because we violated them he died for us now one of the things that's interesting is that is in revelation 15 verse 5 this this is new testament this mm-hmm. is the throne room in heaven right mm-hmm. and the scripture actually says that the tabernacle
tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Mm -hmm. Which suggests then that the Ten Commandments are actually in the throne room in heaven. Mm. So this is not something that's done away with. They're yeah. in the throne Intense. room in right. heaven. Yeah. And in fact, in Hebrews 8, verse 5, quoting from Exodus 25, verse 40, the scripture says that, um, that God told Moses to build the tabernacle, everything about yep. it, to be exactly like the yeah. thing that he saw in heaven. That's good. So if Moses built something, it's like the one that he saw in heaven. And if Moses had these tablets of the testimony, oh, yeah. the ten, then they yeah. must be there. In the Ark of the Covenant, and it actually yeah. says in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 12 through 14, that Jesus entered the holy place once and not without blood. Mm -hmm. In other words, he did with his blood the, the very same thing in heaven yeah. that the high priest on earth did on, on Yom Kippur. Well, that's what he says in Matthew 5. He said, I, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. So like you said, he lived it out. So he, he accomplished living the law without fail. Perfect. And then he fulfilled the requirements of when the law is failed. So he did everything. He just he did under everything. the whole, yeah, he is yeah. the, you know, like an, he's the covering. He's an yep. umbrella. <laughs> he did the, the full gambit. So um, the question I have about what the covenant um, is or the covenants is with the covenants, is it important to distinguish the the that there's a promise within the covenants so it's not just the covenant is the agreement the covenant is the saying it's almost the, like the legal aspect of here i am making a covenant with you but what within the covenant there's a promise attached to the covenant so then in jesus now we have the the we the ability to um to access those promises under a new covenant the promise the covenant might have changed but that the promises are the same. There have is to that be fair? I don't know if yeah. I'm making that up. The, okay. re the reason why sure. there have to be promises in that, if you just, yeah. just think about it logically, is that is that the covenant, <laughs> for example, that Abraham had got with God in Genesis chapter 15, mm -hmm. where God tells Abraham to cut the animals in half, and then Correct. the yep. normal procedure is to walk through the animal parts. And so there, what you're saying when you're doing, as the two people walk through the animal parts, is they're saying that that we are now one. Not Nothing comes between us. Yep. Right. And so that that's the concept of a covenant. But what's interesting is God told Abraham to cut those animals. In, right. And then the scripture says, and a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, another Abram. Actually, what that what that's telling us is that God put Abram to sleep. Mm -hmm. So so if God put so God put him to sleep so that only God would Could pass walk through, through those animal parts. Yeah. Right. And when he went through, he went through as a uh, smoking fire part and a, and, a, and a pillar of fire. Right. Yeah. So he went through as the pillar of fire, and the pillar of smoke, making this covenant, saying, I'm going to bring your children out of Egypt 430 years from now in the fourth generation. They're going to come out. So there is a promise mm -hmm. going to your, directly to your question. Yeah. There is this promise in this covenant. And there has to be a promise if it's an unconditional covenant. Yeah. That's good. That's yeah. good. So, so we have uh, unconditional covenants and then we have conditional covenants, right? You have this, uh, uh, if you do this, I will do this. I will be your God. You will be my people. Yeah. Uh, but then there's this unfaithfulness. If you're unfaithful to me, I'm going to have to vomit you out of the land. You know, if you do this or that, I'm going to have to Absolutely. In a sense, excommunicate. Um, uh, so, so we have Israel and God who have been in this historical bout throughout history where they're faithful, they're unfaithful. They're faithful, they're unfaithful. They're faithful, you know, captivity, bondage, slavery, faithful again, over and over. <laughs> it's like my salvation so, experience. So the two, yeah, the, the, <laughs> primary, guys, come the, the, on. the two primary covenants that Israel has yeah. with God are the Mosaic covenant, <laughs> right, and the Abrahamic covenant. And how would you define those and as so, primary opposed to all the other covenants we so, mentioned earlier? And we also have the new covenant, sure. okay, so as well. So I should say three, but, but okay. sticking with those those first two. The, re the reason why I bring them up in light of what you just said is that the Abrahamic covenant is an unconditional covenant. Okay. And the Mosaic covenant is a conditional covenant. Got it. Moses is being taught, you know, the Mosaic Covenant says, you do this or the, you know, and, and I'll bless you. You don't do this and the land will vomit you out. That's right. So it's a conditional covenant. The Abrahamic Covenant is an unconditional covenant. Agreed. And God's relationship with Israel is he's got these two covenants. Mm. And when it suits his purpose, he pulls out the Abrahamic Covenant 
or when it suits his purpose, he pulls out the Mosaic Covenant. Hmm. When he wants to discipline Israel, he pulls out the Mosaic Covenant. He disciplines them according to that covenant. All the while, he has this unconditional Abrahamic covenant. So he could say to Israel, you have violated the Mosaic Covenant, and therefore I'm going to exile you. So Israel now, the people, are living in exile, and God, because of his uh, his desires, uh, um, although Israel has not repented in 1948, he brings them back into the promised land based upon the Abrahamic covenant. Mm -hmm. And so what we really have, it's really a really cool thing. The first time that Abraham calls upon God, the first time he builds an altar and calls upon God is in Genesis chapter 12, That's right. verse yeah. 7. Yeah. Okay, so in other words, he does not call upon God until after he's already in the land. Mm -hmm. And that's the same picture that we have of the last days in Ezekiel, where the Spirit comes, um, the, 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 the God f brings the bones of Israel together and they oh, stand yeah. up like a man where? In the land. Mm -hmm. And it's when they're in the land that the Spirit comes upon them and they then call upon the Lord. They become spiritually alive. So this this picture of, the, of Israel in the last days is very much like the picture of Abraham and from the very beginning. That's intense. I've That's got a lot of reformed good. theology questions that are coming to my mind <laughs> while asking this. Uh, and, and all I can think of right now is regeneration before we believe or after, but we'll have a different conversation on a different day for that. To keep exactly. it on to keep it on, one. on on topic when we're talking about um, theology, when we're talking about uh, Israel, who who are God's chosen people, you know, my my question, my concern, my 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 frustration, I don't, I don't know, is, is when I come up to Romans 9, there's so much confusion in Romans 9, 10, 11, 12, talking about God's chosen people. Um, who is Israel? Is it the genetically born out of the seed of Abraham, or is it those who redeemed righteous by faith are of the seed of Abraham? Have we been all grafted into that one family, or are there two separate families? Um, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of loaded questions in there, and I know that you can you can probably navigate those waters better than I can. So we talked about Genesis chapter 12 just a little bit, but but kind of tail us into who is Israel now? Well, let me let me take us back actually to Genesis 12 to to answer sure. to, to go to answer that, and 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 I'll just run through um in a very fast way through the first 12 chapters of the Bible. I mean, like amazingly fast. The first two chapters, it's all good. Mm -hmm. Chapter three, it all falls apart. Mm -hmm. Chapter four, there's two murders. Chapter five, you've <laughs> got just these genealogies and the sinful nature of man's being passed down generation mm -hmm. to generation. Chapter six through nine, you got the flood. Why? Because God says, "I'm gonna clean this mess up." Done. Yeah. Right. Ja Done chapter so. ten, you got genealogies again, sinful nature going down. The flood didn't clean up anything. How do we know that? Because in Genesis chapter 11, you have the Tower of Babel, where man sounds like the devil. In, Je in Isaiah 14, the devil says, hey, I'm going to build, a, I'm going to put my throne above the stars of God. And in Genesis chapter 11, man says, we're going to, we're going to make a name for ourselves all the way to heaven. Right. Man sounds like the devil in Genesis chapter 11. So in Genesis chapter 12, God says, okay, the flood didn't work. I'm going to fix it. And the way I'm going to fix it is I'm going to call the first missionary. And that's what Abraham is. Abraham, Abram, is God's first missionary. Mm. He says, I will bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And through you will all the mishpacha, all the families of the earth be blessed. blessed. The reason God called Abram was because he wanted to bless all the nations of the world. That's good. Mm. That, that, that takes us right to something that Jewish people would call like our, our, our core of why we exist, tikkun olam, to repair the world. Mm. Okay, and so, so God chose the Jew because he loves the nations. Mm. Okay, and that's key to this. Now, if we come to Romans... Chapters 9, 10, and 11, and really I would make the point that the reason why the whole book of Romans was written was um, God was saying to the, to the what, what happened was um, Caesar had kicked all the Jews out of Rome, and that's evident because uh, it, it says so in Acts 18, verse 2. Okay, so they were kicked out. So it got Paul meets Priscilla and Aquila in Acts 18 too because they because Caesar had kicked them out. Mm. But in Romans 16 verses 1 and 2, Priscilla and Aquila are back in Rome. Mm. And the, and he says greet them for me. So now you've got these Jews who are back in Rome and the history of the book of Romans essentially is this. The government let the Jews back in and the church was not letting them in. Mm. And so Paul wrote the book of Romans for this purpose to say to the church, 
you have got to let the Jews back into the church. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why the book's written. Which is why he breaks the law down right. so much. So Roman yeah. is, and, and, and so um, the whole book is about the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. So when we get to Romans 9 through 11, you've got this this this, this passage where the, the core of the book, really, it's the core. And um, there's the olive tree mm-hmm. picture in Romans 11, right? Where Israel is the root. And, and now Israel needs to get saved too. Jewish people who don't know Jesus, who don't know Yeshua, they they need to receive Yeshua as well. There's no salvation apart from Jesus. Right. Right. Okay. Right. But but they are the fathers of the faith. And in Romans chapter nine, verse verse four and five, the scripture says, "Who are these Israelites?" And then it says, "To them pertain," and it mentions eight things that actually specifically uh, uh, came to the church through Israel. Romans nine, verse four says, to whom pertain the adoption. So in other words, the, the adoption came to the church through Israel. Israel had the adoption first. This is to mm, the Jew first, yeah, yeah, right? And then he says, the glory. Well, the glory cloud. They Can had argue. the glory first, okay. the yeah. covenants. Even the new covenant, according to Jeremiah 31, was mm-hmm. given to Israel. The church is grafted into it, right? So, and then he says, and the law, the law is a good thing. When you do the right thing with the law, it's beautiful. Right. David said, I love the law. The Antichrist is a mm-hmm. lawless one. Yeah. I'd rather be mm-hmm. like David. Yeah. I just want to do the right thing right. with it. <laughs> it's know? got a purpose. It's, it's got meant a good to purpose. keep us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then he says, the service of God, which is the the Hebrew idea of service is worship. All the principles of worship are, are, are from the Hebrew scriptures, okay? And the promises. Without the promises, you can't have faith. Yeah. These yeah. are all pertain to Israel. He said. Then he says the fathers or the patriarchs. And then he says, from whom, according to the flesh, came Christ, came the Messiah. So these are all things that God gave to the church through Israel. Mm-hmm. Part of Tikkun Olam. Part of this idea that God was going to use Israel to bless the nations of the world. Mm-hmm. But there is one thing that Israel needs, and that is a relationship with God through Yeshua. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's Romans 11, verses 11 and 12. Yeah. And what God did there was he said, okay, there's one thing now. It says, it's, it, 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 it says in Romans 11, verse 11 and 12, it says, salvation has come upon the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Yeah. So you would say, why, to make Israel envious, why did God save the Jew? And here's, here's the, this, I think it's beautiful. Why did God save the Jew? It's because he loves the nations, because he loves the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. But then why did God save the Gentiles? Because he loves the Jew, mm-hmm. okay. We tend to tell people, and that, we see that we see that image. I think we were talking about that before the show. We were talking about how uh, husbands is how you to serve your wives, wives is how you ser- to serve your husbands, and it's for the purpose to administer salvation. Because according to First Corinthians, marriage sanctifies you. It's the process of conforming you to the image of the Son. I mean, even even uh, wives. I think it's in let's say it's in First. Peter, it's like, you know, serving your husband with a selfless heart, uh, you'll win him to the Lord without mm-hmm. a word. Like, it's just serve him and they'll come to his faith. And that's that's this picture that you're you're painting here is totally. that, that Israel is to serve the church and the church is to serve Israel. And the culmination of those things is salvation for all people. I would say Israel is to serve the Gentiles. Okay. And the oh, Gentiles I the church. are okay. to, serve, yes, yes, yes. Okay. to serve Israel. That's an important stipulation. And the reason that's yeah. important is because Israel, what saved Israel is part of the church. Yeah, absolutely. I'm part of the church. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, but I'm also Israel. It's a slip of the tongue because when you're speaking of Israel, you know, you're, you're speaking in, in my mind, especially with the Romans, you're speaking of unbelieving Israel and, and the church opposed to believing Israel and the believing church being the same body. And in That's rea- confusing. And in, Ro- in Romans 11, it actually, it talks about the branches being grafted on. Mm-hmm. And it says, it actually describes unsaved Israel as the branches. Yeah. They are Israel too. The unsaved Israel are the mm-hmm. branches. So the saved Israel, the, the Jews who believe in Yeshua, we are Israel. And the Jews who don't believe in Yeshua, they are Israel just as much. We're wow. both Israel. Mm-hmm. Okay, but but the, the key is is there's only one way to salvation, and that's through Yeshua. So, mm-hmm. like in that Peter passage, it says, Husbands dwell with your wives according to knowledge, so that uh, giving giving honor unto the weaker vessel, first Peter three seven, so that nothing hinder your prayers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In other words, God says to the man, if you don't treat your wife right, I'm not gonna answer your prayers the same way. Mm-hmm. 
And so, so this relationship between a husband and a wife, this is what God wants. You're there for the other. And so the, in Ephesians, it talks about how husbands and wives become one flesh. It doesn't say one body. It doesn't say one soul. It says one flesh, one sarks, one desire. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the same book, Ephesians, is the same book that actually says that the Jews and the Gentiles become one. That's right. The man and the woman do not lose their identity when they marry. Right. There's, but yet there's only there's neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile. The male and the female do not lose their identity when they marry. But 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 being a man or being a woman does not give you any advantage with regard to salvation. And it's the same way with regard to being a Jew or being a Gentile. Okay, we do not lose our identity, but having that identity does not give us any advantage. Again, we must come through mm. Yeshua. The only way to be saved is through Yeshua. But our identities do matter. I'm a man, and when I fell in love with my wife, there was a part of me that woke up. Yeah. It was like I had no idea about this part of my life, but I fell in love with a woman. I will never be a woman. You'll never be a woman, but are you, are you married? I am. You're married. Very married. There's a part, Extra of, married. There's <laughs> a part of your life that woke up you didn't even know about, mm -hmm. and you fell in love. You want to beat your chest and scream, I'm alive, because you fell in love with a woman. Mm -hmm. And that's the, so you became one, but you didn't lose your identity. That's the relationship God wants between Jews and Gentiles within the church. It's good. So I want to talk a little bit about the the identity and the role of both Jew and Gentile within the church. But before we do that, I want to give a quick thank you to our sponsors, the Fellowship Network. We've done a quick little promo for them because they have helped sponsor this episode. So stay tuned. We're going to ask about the roles of Jews and Gentiles up. This episode is brought to you in part by the Fellowship Network. Hey, are you looking to start a Christian nonprofit, a missions organization, or maybe a group that needs tax-free status for ministry purposes? Well, the Fellowship Network is here for you. For over 50 years, they've been providing coverage to hundreds of ministries around the world, giving them legal status to receive tax free donations to support the work of the gospel. The Fellowship Network provides resources, networking, and mentoring, along with 501c3 covering to thousands of members worldwide, and they're here for you to launch your next ministry venture. You can contact them at thefellowshipnetwork.net today to get started. Here's the cut. We're back. Thank you so much for the Fellowship Network. Thank you guys for sponsoring this episode. If you want to sponsor episodes on Remnant Radio, you can go to our website at theremnantradio.com forward slash I don't actually remember. Just click the menu. It's on the it's on the end there at the menu. Uh, uh, what that what that forward slash is, uh, Pastor? You were telling us right before the break about the roles of both Jew and Gentile within the ecclesia within the church. We are one man in Christ, but just like husbands and wives have different roles within the family, uh, Jew and Gentile both have different roles within the church. Give us mm -hmm. an understanding of that. Yeah, we're getting people logging back in here too. Just so uh, sorry, guys. That no, we cut it's off. okay. And I'm, I, I'm saying that on purpose to delay so that we can get people got it some time to hop back on. Hop back on. Genius. I am sometimes when I want to be. <laughs> Go for it, Pat. All right. Go for it. All right. Well. Um, the way I would, the way I like to sometimes explain it is, is, is saying like this: Okay, you are your married man. I am, and you, so in a sense, you are the man of the family. Now, we're not defining what that is exactly, but you are the man of the family. I'm a married man. I'm the man of the family. You and I may not agree on all of the details of what it means to be the man of the family, but there's one thing we will definitely agree on: it means something. Yeah. Okay. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It has a meaning. Yes. It has, and That's it's good. and it's important. So some of the details we may disagree on. Sure. But but the big crunch of it, the big we we complete. It means something to be a to be the man of the family. It means something to be the woman of the family. Okay. So if the family of God includes Jews and Gentiles, then that would mean something. Now your ma masculine identity. Re bring puts you in a place with God in which you're going to have to give accountability on Judgment Day with how you acted as a husband, with how you acted as a father, right. with how you stewarded your masculinity. Yeah. Our wives with how they stewarded their femininity. And re what I'm saying is essentially, in a nutshell, is this. Identity demands function. Yeah. OK, if you are uh, a millionaire, you're going to have to give account on Judgment Day for the way you handle your money. If you're a person who barely has enough money to, to do what you do in life, you're going to give a different kind of account on Judgment Day mm -hmm. because identity demands function. The question then is, is there a such thing as a Jewish identity? And I would suggest to you the scripture is 
plainly screams that there is. Mm-hmm. Okay, one of the things, and I'm going, I, I'm going to your question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that that like theolo- all theologians agree, Matthew is the gospel to the Jews. Matthew, Jews, absolutely. To the Jews. Yeah. No, okay. Without question. It's without question. Yeah. Okay. That's the gospel to the this Jews. This is the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God. Just it, not offend the Jews. And, and it's <laughs> absolutely. The, yeah. whole, the whole gospel. I mean, yeah. it's just, okay, so now watch watch what happens and how easily we 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 miss this, okay, on the significance of this. The the gospel of Matthew has what we call the Great Commission. Mm-hmm. Now it's not the only gospel to have a great commission, but it they all in fact they all have a commission. But if the gospel of Matthew is the gospel to the Jew, Mm -hmm. it only makes sense that the commission in Matthew is the commission for the Jew. Hmm. And that and that's why it is a little bit unique, mm-hmm. a little bit distinct All creation. from the other gospels. Oh, okay? I'm seeing it now. So now listen. So this, <laughs> yeah. this now I that, smell what you're stepping in. Yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> this does not mean that there's not many applications teaching them. All but let's but let's go right to the context. Let's Good. let's not, you know, let's not, you know, avoid what it actually says in context and exactly what Matthew meant. And what we want to do is we want to say, well, it applies here, it applies there. Okay, it applies. That's all wonderful. That's good. Mm -hmm. But what was Matthew actually intending to say? Mm. He's writing a gospel to the Jew. Well, then the Great Commission's to the Jew. And here is what he has to say. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples, which would mean students, okay, of all the nations. What's the word for nations? It's it's ethnos in the Greek, but it's essentially, in if there were Hebrew, it would be the word goyim. Yeah. Okay. Making disciples of all of the goyim, making disciples of all of the nations. Okay. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then he says, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, uh, and and lo, I'm with you always until the end of the age. But with this idea that I'm teaching you all things that I've commanded you, well, Deuteronomy actually says, what other nation has such great commandments. Mm. What is the Jewish person's function in the body of Messiah? It is to teach the, the body of Messiah the relevancy of the Torah, how mm. it applies to them. And this is w- exactly what we see the apostles starting to do in Acts 15 when the question came up at the first council of Jerusalem, mm-hmm. I was thinking that do the instantly. Gentiles have to be circumcised? Not, 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 yeah. And they answer, no. They, and then actually in Acts 15 verses 20 through 29, they say they don't, and they'll say there's four necessary, actually uses the word necessary things for Gentiles. Don't eat blood. Don't eat blood. Um, uh, take care of the the widow over in the. the no, that's not one of the four, but that is, but that is that's yeah. true. Is, is mm-hmm. that one that's that's uh, that's James one twenty seven. Yeah. Well, no, I know that's refrain weird. from sexual immorality. Yeah, yep. that's that. Yeah. Start with the easy ones: sexual yeah. immorality, idolatry. idolatry, idolatry. Okay, don't eat blood. Don't eat strangled animals. Yeah. Three of the oh, things actually animals, have to yeah. do with food, by the yeah. way, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is kind of interesting because you could make the point, and I do make this point often, that. Eating is the central act of worship in the Bible. Most of us think it's singing, but it's actually eating. Communion is the central act of worship. There are no songs that are sung worldwide in the church today, but everybody eats communion. Yeah. Communion is the central act of worship. The fall of man happened on the battlefield of food. Okay, all oh, of the sacrifices man. were eaten except for the whole burnt offering, and that whole burnt offering wasn't eaten because it was God's food. All of the rest of the sacrifices are basically God gets the best part of it, and the priest eats some, and the worshiper gets yeah. to eat some. Yeah. Okay? So that's the sacrifices. The tithing was so that there would be food in my house. Um, so all of the um, all, eating is the central act of worship. Um, and the New Testament will actually say, whatever you eat or drink, do it under Unto the, the glory of the Lord as yeah. an act of worship. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So at that, now I'm not ta- I'm not saying, and I don't believe that Gentiles should avoid from pork. Sure. Okay. That's not my point. My point is, whatever you're eating, and every time you eat, and in fact, if you eat anything that did not die, it will not nourish you. If it's a chemical, if it didn't die, Man. a piece of meat had to die. It'll nourish you. Yeah. A plant had to die. It'll nourish you. The cross is built into creation. 
Okay, eating is the central act of worship. This is so cool. It is very cool. Really okay? cool. <laughs> it is the central act. Every time we I'm all eat. thinking about. So, so now what I'm doing is I'm just, see, what the apostles did in Acts 15 was they started this process where they said, these are the things that are required. They didn't, they didn't, that's not the end of, act, of, 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 of the Jewish responsibility, as it were. That's the beginning. You're, mm-hmm. you're listening to me do some of it now. Yeah. So what does a Jew do? A Jew, a Jew's function in the body of Messiah is to help them understand the relevancy of the eternal Torah, because the Torah is eternal. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Man. Man. Okay, so so I keep looking for this verse, and, it, and it's coming up short on my on my mind. Uh, is it in Galatians? Because Galatians chapter two also references um, the Acts fifteen account. But the, the the verse that I'm I'm thinking of is we were uh, to to care for the poor, which we were already willing to do, or we're already eager to do. That's where that verse that I was trying to come up with a second ago. Um, do you know which one I'm referring to? Am, I, I do, but you know where I'd pull that right out of. I'd pull that right out of Leviticus 19, yeah. verse 18, which says, love your neighbor as yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Which, by the way, most people think that that Jesus was teaching new things and the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus didn't teach sure. anything new, Yeah. especially at the Sermon on the Mount. What he did was he fulfilled it. And what that fulfilled means doesn't mean abolish, doesn't mean abolish in any way. Not even one jot, not one tittle. What it means is he showed the full purpose. Mm-hmm. So he goes from Je- from Matthew chapter five. See, this is the Jewish gospel. Yeah. Okay. And so he's talking to Jewish people, and I'm glad Gentiles can read it and get blessed, and they should. Sure. But he's talking to Jewish people. Yeah. There's and context. So, so while talking to Jewish people, he says, "Not one jot, not one tittle." Now, circumcision's not a little jot. Circumcision is the everywhere. big kahuna to the Jew, <laughs> yeah. right? There's nothing bigger to the Jew. Yeah. Okay, so Matthew 5, 17 through 19, he says, he says hey, uh, uh, you, know, you know, not one jot, not one tittle. He says, he says if you teach people to, 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 uh, to violate the least of these laws and yeah. you don't, he says, you'll be little in heaven. If you if you teach people to keep the greatest and you keep it yourself, you'll be great in heaven. And then he says in the next verse, in verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you won't get into heaven. So Matthew 5, 17 through 20 describes three kinds of people. It describes those who don't get into heaven. It describes those who do get into heaven, but they're little. It describes those who do get into heaven and they're great. Understanding that the context is to the Jew, Okay. Got to, got to keep that context. Then what he's saying is this is a sermon that is to the Jew and he's explaining the law. And, you know, he so and you can tell he's not talking to the Gentiles in Matthew five because he's he's requiring every law there mm-hmm. in in Acts 21. Paul is asked by the apostles. They, they challenge him. It's being reported that you're telling uh, Jews that they don't have to keep the law, they don't have to keep, be circumcised. Is that true? And Paul says, that is certainly not true. And they say to Paul, we want you to prove it's not true. And Paul says, okay, how would you like me to do that? And Paul, and they tell Paul, we would like you to pay for the Nazarite vow that these four other Jewish men are going to do. Paul says, I'm happy to do it. And in fact, the Nazarite vow, the shaving Shave of the head, head. Mm-hmm. The, yep. right? Okay. The shaving of the head is something Paul did back in Acts 18, 18. So Paul has a lifestyle of this, mm-hmm. right? Paul has no problem with Nazarite vows. So the idea that, so, so the apostles in Acts 21 are saying for the Jew, they've got to keep the law. For the Gentile in Acts 15, they don't have to keep the law. So with the, uh, so. Uh, the law is an act of worship. It's not a matter of, there's, it's not a salvific Right, thing. it's not, you're not made Even righteous. Even for the Jew. Sure. Yeah. So why would you get water baptized? As an act of worship, sure. not as an act of salvation, right? You're saved before you went in the water, right? right? It's an act of worship. Why would you tithe for salvation? No, as an act of worship. Yeah. Why would you go to, why do you go to church for salvation? No, as an act of worship, right? So why would a Jew keep the Torah? Okay, as an act of worship. And what this shows is that the Torah then still exists in its fullness for the Jew. And that what the Gentiles just, they just have a different relationship with the Torah Mm -hmm. than the Jews do. The Torah has not been obliterated. It is not removed. Okay, not one jot, not one tittle shall by any means. If we could come up with a means, that's the one means Jesus says no. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the Torah still exists. You just you don't have to keep it all. 
Yeah. And I like to sometimes say that the Jewish part in the relationship is to show that there is such a thing as holiness, to show that there is such a thing as clear standards with God. And the Gentile part in the relationship is to show that there is such a thing as grace and forgiveness. And come on, let's lighten up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Okay, that's what so I've always associated it with is in the sense of, you know, you have even dif different denominations within the body of Christ, the body of Messiah, as you were, you were saying. And it's not that one is right or one is wrong. It's that they, they emphasize certain things. And that's where they feel they are called to really emphasize. Like, you know, you have Methodists that are, we're all about mission work. And then you have the Baptist church that we're all about the message of, you know, grace. And so you have these, these, they're highlighting certain things, but it doesn't mean one is different or, or one is better than the other or and one is right or one wife. is wrong. Yeah, exactly. A husband so, and a wife. Ch ch stand that's typically, really good. not always, but typically yeah. the husband, the, the father is going to be a lot stricter, mm -hmm. not always, but a lot more black and white. Yep. And the wife, not always be the more gracious so, person. It's just, I, we bring something different into the relationship yeah. because our identities are different. When I think about when I think about having to, as a Jew would have to keep the law, you know, or as, a, as an act of worship, like you were talking about, um, that seems very stressful to me, though. <laughs> like when I would think about having to to do that, do you feel like? I mean, is there like a biblical standard or whatever? Do you feel like there's an actual an aspect of grace for the Jew Absolutely. in order to keep the law? And so, that's why the Gentile goes, hey, man, that freaks me out. And you're like, so, oh, it's so, 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 <laughs> so, so the way I would describe it, first, mm -hmm. first, we have to be a, a Jew has to approach the Torah from the perspective of there's a lot of this I can't keep. There's yeah, a lot there's no of the Torah because there's right. no temple. I don't yeah, live in Israel. That's intense. Right? waiting so, on your red so heifer. the pressure, right, the pressure that is on a Jew as he struggles with what should I be doing? And so it's a different kind of relationship. Okay, we feel a pressure that we should. And so we feel this pressure like, what should I be doing? And do I need to move to Israel because I'm called to the land? Mm -hmm. And so Jews will feel this kind of pressure. And Gentiles, they'll read this, the, the Hebrew scriptures from the perspective of God. What do you want? What do you, how does this speak to me? And what do you want from me? Well, Jews will do that too, but Gentiles, it's just a different standard. Mm -hmm. I, you say, you know, going to your question more directly by way of example, okay? Um, are Gentiles required to keep Passover? No. But you get to. You get to. Yeah. <laughs> but is, is there a scriptural basis for suggesting that God still wants Jews to keep Passover? Yeah. Is there a scriptural basis for saying that God still wants Jews to fast on Yom Kippur? Yeah. Do so Gentiles you, have to fast on Yom Kippur? Would you would you hold that even like like a, the Sabbath being a Saturday day Sabbath would Is there a held? scriptural basis for Jews to honor the Sabbath? Right, that's that's Absolutely. my question. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so, yes. so the Sabbath is the sign of Moses's covenant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But right? so whenever Paul's talking about, I believe it's Paul was talking about, like you know, some consider one day holy, others consider all all day holy. That is that more towards Gentiles when he's well. Actually, that that's an interesting thing because that's in Romans, and the okay. whole book of Romans is about this relationship between Jews and Gentiles. Okay. Okay. And so he's dealing, and, and the next verse or the the adjacent verse says uh, some eat, some people eat only some things, some people, right? Yeah. So so he, he deals with two issues there, the laws of eating, kosh, kashrut, and mm. the laws of, of the Sabbath. But one of the things that's interesting about that passage with the, the one day holy versus all days holy is one of the options that's not given is to consider all days profane. Oh, wow. That is not given. Yeah. Right? That is not an option. Yeah. Don't not, choose that one, guys. Not not for <laughs> Jews or Gentiles. Yeah. And it's interesting because the Ten Commandments, there's only one commandment that deals with time. Right? And so the, the scripture says in Colossians 2, it says, let no man judge you in the keeping of the Sabbath. Eating, drink, holy days. But it doesn't say yeah. don't keep it. No, that's right. It just says, let no man judge you in it. Don't even judge yourself on it. No judging, right? Mm -hmm. But, but, and why would, why would Paul say that? And here's my take on that. Sure. Okay. Why'd they kill Jesus? In John chapter um, 5, verse 18, the scripture says that the reason that they sought to kill Jesus because of two things. One was how he kept the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And two was because he made himself equal, equal with to God. God. Yeah. yeah. So, so the Sabbath is a huge deal. And yes, Jews feel now reform Jews who knows what they feel okay but sure but Orthodox Jews and conservative Jews they will they will and Messianic Jews like myself 
um, we will say, yeah, the Sabbath is a, is part of our identity. So we will struggle with, for example, should I, you know, do I need to do this or that? Because how do I do that? How do I fit this in my life where I'm at? And what mm -hmm. do I do? I mean, how do I do this? The and relationship that, with the law is just different. And that is a means for salvation, but a means of worship. But again, and this is kind of the next conclusion question is, is does that mean of means of worship get you a better place in heaven? Though it doesn't save you or not save you, you know, does the, the Jew who follow Sabbath Saturday versus Saturday, Saturday Sunday Sabbath day. You obviously, you and I both know that those aren't different things. But if the one who follows the Saturday Sabbath, he's he getting a bigger platform in heaven well, than the one who gets a first, Saturday. First, Sabbath? Let, let me suggest I really don't think that the Saturday versus Sunday thing is an issue at all. Sure, I, like at all, even for a Jew. Although a lot of Jews would be upset with me for what I just said. Sure, I think what God I, they would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think the real issue. There is that what God is saying is I want one day a week. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And so um, uh, I remember 30 years ago calling up Yeshiva in in uh, in New York City, and I had a calendar question. I was, and uh, and the the rabbi I spoke with on the phone said, you know, the ra the the calendar's changed six times since Moses. Literally, he wasn't just yeah. saying that. It's actually changed. We changed the calendar. Yeah. So so there's change. So the idea. That it has to be on Saturday yeah. versus on Sunday. Who knows now? He, right. Wednesday exactly. could be Saturday for all we That's know. That's exactly my point. <laughs> so, so, so do I think, though, that Jews, you know, like, so... so. But you see the application, even I if do. it's not the Saturday Sunday yeah. thing. If it's if it's kosher, if it's if it's uh, well, the intent of the heart Jews matters. Have a better place in heaven. I wouldn't say that at all. No, 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 no. no. I, Jew versus Jew, like right now, like no, no <laughs> Gentiles involved. Two Jews. One uh, doesn't know they're a Jew and is following Christianity as a Gentile, and the other one is a Jew, but because one is following the Sabbath. I mean, it sounds like the, the statement that you had made earlier was. Well, would you say? Would you say for yourself, mm -hmm. as a Gentile, mm -hmm. uh, that you would have a better seat in heaven if if you kept if you if you, if you went to church. Or kept kosher law? kept kosher. Absolutely not. But that was my question was based on what you had said earlier about the, the Jews who teach the jots and the tittles and they keep the jots. There's two, well, there's three different righteousness. Can I interject on this? Yeah. Because I would say, I would say yes, but not in the way you're thinking. I would say yes, they could have a better seat based on the intent of the heart and wh why they're doing what they're doing. But it's not better in comparison to you. It's better for them. Meaning it's the individual, like what does God have an purpose for you like what is his intent for you um what is a better seat first of all you know it, nearness to god revelation of who he is in heaven i mean it, we all get the equal well, amount it sounds like there's so a, there's a lot of things reward, there's a lot yeah. of dynamics but what i'm saying is that if there were a better seat it's only better for you it's not in comparison, like, oh, man, I got a better seat than Josh. I, mean, I, think, I had a better seat that I could have had if I wouldn't have done as much. Jeff, I, I Does think, it make sense? I think you are. What you're saying makes a lot of sense. Like, like, OK, so let, let me use an let me use it by way of example. He's not judging me based on you. So how can I have a better seat than you? Sure. Um, <laughs> so. but by, by way of example. OK, um, I have twin boys. Mm -hmm. OK, so it, it, you're Jewish and you have twin boys. Yeah. <laughs> So, so the odds. Yeah, and, and so, <laughs> like, and my Hebrew name was Isaac. That's oh, my, no, there my it is. Why yeah, yeah, can we get any? So, so here I have these twin. So let, <laughs> let, let, let me give you an illustration. I, I totally made it up, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but the, these, okay, two, two twins, they grow up, they're identical twins, and they grow up in, in the same home, eating the same food with the same parents, getting the same education, and, uh, and, and graduate about with the same grades, with the same kinds of interest, and they go off to different colleges, uh, because they wanted some difference in their life, but they go to similar colleges and get actually similar degrees because they're, they're just gifted similarly. And they get similar degrees and they graduate from college and they get a job in different companies on the other side of the country from each other. Uh, but they're basically similar jobs working in similar companies. Mm -hmm. And while there, they happen to both meet a girl. And coincidentally, these two girls happen to be identical twins. Who grew up in the same home, eating the same food, right? Because they're identical twins, going to the same high school, getting the same degrees, different, similar colleges. You can just see the picture. So, and this one man marries this one woman, and this man marries this woman, okay? And their children are confused and, eternally. And so, and the, okay, so, and you know, all things <laughs> are never muggle. equal. And here's, that's why I call this the all things being equal principle mm -hmm. okay because all things are never equal okay okay but as close as you can get these two couples are pretty equal sure. the only difference between these two couples is 
this couple goes to church, this couple sleeps in on Sunday. Which couple do you think God would bless? Yeah. Let's just change the principle. They both go to church. This couple tithes, that couple doesn't. Which couple do you think God would bless? Now, all things are never equal, okay? But all things being equal. All thi this couple gives to the poor, this couple doesn't. This couple works at a homeless shelter, you know, once a month, this couple doesn't. Mm -hmm. Which couple do you think, this is an, I call this the all things being equal principle. Sure. So like you said, it's for me, okay? So that, like, so, so it, this is how I've tried to run my life now. Okay, you grab a principle and run with it and develop that principle. And when that principle becomes a part of your life, then go ahead and grab another principle and begin sure. to work on it. One of these all things being equal principles is I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse. I will curse him who curses you. Mm -hmm. And through you will all the families of the earth be blessed. Now it says all. So it's an all things being equal principle. It is not the only principle. In sure. Life. So lots of lots of questions, man. I, I know we don't have time, but I, I've got to ask some no. of these. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, one of them being, <laughs> we have Luke. This guy's a Gentile. He's discipled by Paul. He travels with Paul for ever, right? At some point in time, I, I hope that Luke accumulates a quarter of the knowledge of Paul about the Jewish roots, right? Um, but he's a Gentile, right? Does, does he... Is, you know, we talk about our different roles, our different identities, right? Me as a teacher, I, I believe I'm called to teach. In, in my teaching, if I'm going to be a good teacher, I need to have the, un, the Jewish understanding of a text so that I can understand the Jewish text. Now, if the Jewish role is to teach the Jewish influence, but a Gentile can facilitate that role. Absolutely. Isn't that, isn't that odd? Isn't that, so it, 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 almost, it almost breaks down the, the marriage illustration because there are roles that that are distinctly male that only men should do, and there are roles that are distinctly woman that only women should do. But it seems as if the Jew Gentile can blur those mission. You know, but you know, does that make sense? Yeah, but I, I would say that even within a family, <clears throat> yeah, some of those roles, like 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 for example, sure. I'm far more talkative than my wife is. Oh, me too. Okay. Yeah. And so 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 this the this, this typical standard kinds of things are not always exactly the way it is sure so um by the way there's an interesting book uh by uh dr david allen on the lucan authorship of the book of hebrews and he actually that's argued, what i was asking yeah oh you know about it yeah yeah that's uh, and, and uh, he actually argues that luke is jewish yeah I, oh he argues that luke is jewish yeah see i had i had the 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 notion because I, I've, I've done a bit of research on luke being the author of this book um that uh if if he is the author, he could be a Gentile man who understands he may Hebraic, be Gentile. He, who, who understands Hebraic Dr. Allen roots. deals with the whole thing in Colossians where we get the idea. I mean, of if, if I sat underneath you for you know five years, I would hope I'd come up with half of the information that you have <laughs> on the Jewish movement. So to be able to have that knowledge and go, okay, here, let me teach that content. So, so let, let me just give you a, right? one interesting thought, okay, just to, on Luke, on sure. Luke's gospel. Okay, I know that historically we call Matthew the gospel to the Jew. Mm -hmm. But in many regards, Luke is the most Jewish gospel. He is the only gospel that tells about the circumcision of Jesus. Mm. He is the only gospel that tells about the bar mitzvah of Jesus when he's 12. Yeah. In many regards, he's hmm. the only gospel that takes you into the holy place where Gabriel tells, right, the uh, Zechariah. Zechariah that you're going to have, right? So in many regards, Luke is the most Jewish of the gospels. Okay, I understand it's not the gospel to sure. the Jew, but it certainly does carry some really significant, weighty Jewish thinking. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. so, so, again, so many questions. I'm trying to keep up with time. We, we've got about, I'll say, eight minutes because the other video stopped at 27. So, um, in Good math. Yeah, thanks. Uh, math is hard. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, you know, looking at some of these, uh, the Jewish Gentile question uh, and talking about their ministries, uh, they're different in, in, in many ways. Uh, the, the question of, you know, bless those who, who, who bless you. Um, when, I, when I bless ethnic Israel, if I walk up to an Israelite who, who good Samaritan story, they've been beaten, they're laying there on the ground, don't believe in Yeshua. I pray for them, I clothe them, I take them to an inn, doctor, whatever, takes care of them, I move along my merry way. Uh, a Christian, beat beyond recognition of a man, same kind of situation, 
how how does God approach those? I have an unbelieving Jew. I have a believing Christian. Do I do I? It's it's not like you have to do either or. I'm not I'm not trying to a- ask you to answer an un unreadable uh, question. But how how do we approach non-believing Jews theologically? Obviously, we care for those who are hurting. Well, period. one of the things I would say is first, um, where the church has gone south, done the wrong wrong way. Yeah, anti-Semitic is anti-Semitic. Yeah. So when they've gone to the place like Luther did, where he, you know he talked about dealing with Jews with harsh mercy and yeah, really the deicide, they killed God, can't yeah, be forgiven. Yeah, right? And sure. so. So hmm. the, um, Paul said in Timothy, he said, uh, do not rebuke an elder, but treat, honor him like a father, exhort him like a father. Mm-hmm. So if Israel is the fathers of the church, yeah. which Paul directly says in Romans chapter yeah, 9, the patriarchs. Verse, verses 4 and 5, if, if they are, then the wrong way to witness to a Jew is with fire and brimstone. Yeah. That's just the wrong way. Absolutely. And yeah. you would, you, we witness to Jewish people. In fact, about 80%, I, I do this all the time. I ask Jews all the time. So uh, it's more than an anecdote for me. I, I've had a lot of time. I'll ask Jewish, say, save Jews, how'd you get saved? 80% of the time, they'll say they were led to the Lord by a Gentile. Yeah. Okay. Gentiles don't have to know the Jewish stuff. They do it by just loving and honoring. I was mm-hmm. won t- to the Lord by a Gentile who would ask me questions like, what did you do for Sabbath growing up? What did you do for Passover? Mm. How, right? And that kind of honoring question. And then when he said, would you like to go to church with me sometime? I went with him. I got saved. Yeah. Oh, okay. wow. And that's Praise a God. very common, that's yeah. a common way Jews get saved. Okay, the way they won't come to the Lord is with this fire brimstone pushing because you're not honoring like a father. Right. Yeah. Okay. And it's interesting because the fifth commandment, which is honor your father and mother. Okay. If that's only about biology, okay. But if if we're actually going to look for who are the spiritual fathers sure. of the church. Yeah. Well, Paul talks about it directly to himself. He's like, I'm your father. Like, you need yeah. to show me some love. As a person. <laughs> as a person. Yeah. But as a group. Is there a group of people, Mm -hmm. the only group of people Mm -hmm. that you could, in the scripture, identify as the fathers of the church is Israel. And what I would say is that the way that you witness to to Israel in in principle is by honoring them and helping them and blessing them, supporting Israel. I I know I completely agree. I just so I have these these difficult. You know, but people, that doesn't mean that the only people we do this for. We do this no, for everybody. everybody. Yeah. And, that's, and that's, that's how I, I frame the question. We do good at all, man. I guess, I guess the, the question that's really awesome. is, it, it was pitted to me in a very aggressive sort of way um, when, when someone asked flag. me, hey, <laughs> is God at war with Israel? If, if, if those who are unbelieving, God is at war with, are his, they his people or is he at war with them? Like that was a hard question for me to answer. Well, I was like in part, a corner my, and I my go. My answer uh, would be first would be that um, we're supposed to be in the ministry of reconciliation. Yep. That is telling people that God is not holding their sin against them. So the whole idea that God is at war with anybody like that is 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 so not New Testament. By the way, just I I, I, I want to correct myself. I knew I was going to say it that way, sure. but I want to correct something. Aren't you glad we don't live in those harsh Old Testament days? Like when Paul blinded Elimus. Oh, but that's New Testament. Yep. Yeah. Well, aren't you glad we don't live in those mm-hmm. harsh Old Testament and days? Like spiral. when God ate <laughs> up uh, Herod with worms. Oh, that's mm. New Testament. Well, aren't you glad we live in these kind, gracious New Testament days like where God tells Hosea to take that woman back? Oh, that's Old Testament. Yeah. The entire idea that the New Testament is grace and the Old Testament is law and harsh is a completely oh. erroneous poppycock. Com- completely agree com- with you. Hogwash. Absolutely, just, it's it's garbage. And I uh, and I'd go so far as to say it's built trash can emoji it's built upon anti-Semitism. <laughs> Poop emoji, um, the one with the bow tie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, no, so so uh, I mean, you would you would make the case that that God. So Romans chapter two, um, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. Right. So the God's and, heart burns in in wrath towards those who don't believe in Christ. That's when you say at war with, that's the imagery. But there. he is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins mm-hmm. only, but also for <clears> the <throat> sins of the world. Of those who believe. Yeah, absolutely. Of the world. Yeah. Right. So I, I think that what we need to do is be presenting uh, a message of reconciliation to people that is God loves you. And, 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 and you don't have to be that way. You God God loves you. 
Right. He, 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 you know, this, this is the message that I would preach to both yeah. Jew and Gentile. Right. And that's, mm-hmm. that's not even, I mean, ultimately my question isn't, isn't how do I witness to these people? It's my, my question is there's this cognitive dissonance between obviously God has a plan for Israel in the old times. I see it plain as day, obvious right there. There's Israel. God longs to have Israel gathered to himself. He wants them. He loves them. But there's this also white hot burning anger towards people who don't believe in Christ. I can get angry with my wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Isaiah 49, by the way, calls Israel the bride of God. Now, that's kind of interesting, okay? Because you can get angry with your wife. Sure. I'm married 37 years, okay? Um, So, so, uh, but I still love her. Yeah. Um, By the way, um, we uh, we typically say that the church is the bride. Let me just address that for a second. Sure. Okay, now let me, I need to give the answer before I, because I'll just, people will just blow up over this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you challenge orthodoxy? I'm yeah, let's do it, man. Okay. Hey, we got a part the, two coming the, up. I'm going to book it when we, when we end this the episode. The only reason, <laughs> the only reason the church is the bride is because she is grafted onto Israel. Absolutely. That's the only sure. reason. Okay, because uh, Ephesians 5 says, husbands love your wives as, as Christ, Christ loved, loved the, the church, church and gave himself for Okay, now it uses that word as. By definition, that is a simile. Mm-hmm. By definition, that is a metaphor. Okay, imagine if a man walked in here who is six foot six, and I said, you're as tall as a tree. Mm-hmm. Did I just say he is a tree? No, I used a metaphor. He is, in fact, not a tree because a metaphor is not a statement of fact. The reason what God is saying in Ephesians 5 is that husbands should love their wives the same way Jesus loves the church. Okay, he died for the church. Mm-hmm. But the fact is that God actually says Israel is the bride. Yeah. And actually in the second to last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, uh, in verse 9, I believe it is, um, the, the, the angel actually says to John, come and I will show you the bride. Yeah. Right. Now, this is not a metaphor. And when he says, I'll show, what does he see? He sees the new Jerusalem coming down dressed as a bride. Mm-hmm. Okay. And on the, and this bride has 12 cornerstones. And what are the names on the 12 cornerstones? 12 apostles. Tri- They're yeah. all Jews. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then it also has the names of 12 tribes. Yeah. Okay. Who are also Jews. Mm-hmm. And it would be fair to say that if the names of Jews are on the foundation stones, it makes sense that the names of the tribes are not on the bottom. They must be on the top. Yeah. Right. They, so which would mean that every single person who enters the new heaven, who enters the new Jerusalem, is entering through a gate, looking down at a, one Jewish name and up at another Jewish name. Every person who enters heaven enters through Israel. That's good. And mm-hmm. there are no anti-Semites. No, no. I, I hear that. <laughs> and I'm all about it, man. I'm there, all about it. There's none of them. Yeah. What, no, about, what about, I think, is it, I don't know if it's John 8, I believe, where he says not all who are who are called Israel are Israel, though. What about the aspect of... That, I mean, not all who are, who, who are Israel are Israel. Yeah. And that's true. I mean, you know, you could look at... Uh, look Because I think he's referencing the... the by blood, the the biological aspect of being a Jew in that, if I'm, I think if I'm wrong. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, you know, there is a sense, I mean, because... You Those know, all who are born of Abraham are not of Abraham. Yeah, yeah. is that what I was... Yeah, of yeah your father, I to say. Yeah. You know, you're not like your father Abraham. So there they is say, He says you're language. of the devil, is what he says. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jesus, yeah. 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 yeah, so there's a spiritual <clears throat> side and there's a biological side. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, so we have got to wrap up. Uh, I want to thank Check everyone who has uh, tuned in this week to Remnant Radio. I want to thank uh, Pastor Greg so much for coming on. It's mm-hmm. been a blast. Oh, and, and again, I'm going to have to book episode two because oh. I've still got so many epi- so many questions. And we'll pick up where we left off. But for those of you uh, who are watching the program, mm-hmm. we want to thank you so much for tuning in. Yep. You can tune in every single Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Yep. Uh, you can watch us on Facebook, YouTube, Insta- Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, <laughs> uh, our, our podcast platforms, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, we're mm-hmm. everywhere you can find us. Uh, if you want to sponsor us, you can take care of us, uh, theremnantradio.com. You can donate there. You can become a sponsor if you want to have your advertisement yeah. run on the Fellowship program. Fellowship Network, shout out. Thank hey, you guys. Thank you so much, guys, for for helping us uh, sponsor this episode. I want to give a quick shout out to Demystifying the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Me and Michael Miller did this series uh, uh, at the beginning of the year. We released it uh, January 19th. Did uh, really, really good on our release. Mm-hmm. I hope you guys are interested in it. I'm going to run this ad and I'm going to I'm going to finish out the program. So good reviews. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, thus far. Really great mm-hmm. stuff. So be blessed. Hope you guys enjoy. So I was like, it. okay, God, I feel like you're telling me that this guy's been praying the words, will I recover? Well, what's he trying to recover from? Now I'm listening and I don't hear anything. It's like mm-hmm. radio silence. So, okay, you're not telling me that. What do you want me to tell him? And just a thought goes through my head. Michael, just tell him, yes, you will recover. This is like, okay. Now this seems super vague to me. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one thing I don't like doing is when you, I'm give, with you. It, when you give vague words that can apply to anybody, all that does is leave those who are skeptical, more skeptical. Mm-hmm. Um, unless it's something really uncanny in a very crazy way. And the only way you're going to know that is when the other person tells you that. Oh yeah. So I get up there, I'm on the stage. I look at this man. I said, Hey, I feel like you've been praying the words. Will I recover? And God wants you to know, I said, I asked him what you're trying to recover from, but he didn't tell me, but he just wants you to know, yes, you will recover. I go, does that mean anything to you? I see, this is what I think it looks like to actually weigh the words, to judge Mm -hmm. what's spoken. He goes, yeah, bro, you just totally read my mail. (laughs) And so I said, well, what do you mean by that? Like, why is this so important? I said, just come talk to me after the service. I'd, I'd like to know more about this. So he comes up to me, tears in his eyes, and he says, this morning I was getting my kids ready for church, and I prayed, God, will I recover from my divorce? Mm. 